You're listening to the Nutrition Experts Podcast, featuring guests who take the scientific talk about food and break it down for practical use. You've heard the phrase, you are what you eat. Come find out what that really means. Experience conversations with experts in the field of nutrition and understand the power of food for our health, well-being, and beyond. Now, here's your host, registered dietitian and nutritionist, Mathia Ford. Hi there, it's Mathia. Welcome back to the Nutrition Experts Podcast, the podcast featuring nutrition experts who are leading the way using food starts today, right now with our next guest. It's great to have Rebecca Scritchfield on the show today. Rebecca, welcome to Nutrition Experts. I'm excited to have you on the show and share your expertise with my tribe. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here today. Rebecca, I am excited to have you because you have a great book, Body Kindness, and we're going to talk about body kindness today, but will you tell my listeners a little more about you and what you do? Absolutely. So I am a registered dietitian and nutritionist and a certified exercise physiologist. And I've had my private practice based in Washington, DC since 2007. And so I see people in DC in person. I see a variety of ages. So I work with families and usually with um, kids around time of puberty, where there are some, you know, growth and body changes and the pediatricians might refer them to um, well-being uh, grounded behavioral counseling around nutrition and movement and self-care. I also work with a fair number of college students who might be performing in their sport and wanting to optimize in nutrition. And um, sometimes they are dealing with body image or weight concerns um, related to their sports and performance. I also work with people who are struggling with disordered eating and eating disorders. And that could be, you know, any time in their life, if it was a history of an eating disorder or currently we're discovering that there's an eating disorder and we might need to um, make a decision about is outpatient the right place for them to um, get recovery support or um, do we work with a higher level of care and then come to an outpatient setting. And I have a lot of women also who are at some stage in their pregnancy or postpartum. So anywhere from trying to conceive throughout pregnancy or the first um, couple of years postpartum, um, which is a real important point, um, part of life for, for body kindness, especially. And it's so interesting because I actually wrote the book when I was, I had a six month old and a one and a half year old. So it was almost like writing to myself exactly what I needed to hear when all of a sudden, you know, my life was changing and, you know, body changes and trying to get a new handle on the mother thing. And I had no self-compassion. And my husband said like, Think, think about your clients and what would you say to clients? And, and, and that's ultimately how body kindness came to be. But one of the things that I also find really important is that since body kindness has come out, it got the attention of a university research lab and they are interested in studying body kindness as a philosophy and improving body image and postpartum women. Um, so we're actually doing this survey right now that people can uh, participate in and I'd be happy to share more information about it. The point of it is, is to get insights as to how um, we can help women enhance their body image as their body changes, especially in the pregnancy and postpartum period so that they have a better well-being and that they're, they have a, a strong caregiving foundation taking care of themselves without feeling body shame or that it's about getting that baby body back or whatever we might hear about in the media to kind of reframe their mindset more toward um, enhancing their well-being and self-care. That's amazing. I have a friend who always reminds me when you say something bad about yourself, like I'm not very good or I can't remember to do this or whatever. They say, would you say that to another person? Don't insult my favorite person because this is so, but we do have a lot of those um, scripts or whatever you'd call them in your head. So can you give, you've mentioned body kindness a couple of times. Can you give kind of an overview of what body kindness is? Sure. It is a philosophy about being good to yourself. It actually is quite simple. It's about how you can create a better life um, by focusing on your well-being enhancement. And so there are three pillars. The first pillar is love and it's the guide is to make choices from a place of love. So this could be when you have work that you 
need to do or want to do, whether it's you feel negative stress energy about the bosses on your back, or you're actually really excited about the work project. But the reality is it's later in the day, you need to get going on dinner. Maybe even you need to rest after dinner and go to bed instead of burning the midnight oil. So making a choice from a place of love in that standpoint would be choosing to go to sleep, even though there's other things that you should do or you want to do, but you also value your sleep and you know that's important. So you choose to get in bed on time so that you can get the rest your body needs so that the next day's energy is refueled. Um, So that's just one simple example about making a choice from a place of love. The second principle is connect to your body. The foundation in the book, The Connection, is about connecting directly to your body. So it was, um, it could be anything from intuitive eating to mindfulness practices to connecting to your emotions. Um, so I talk in the book about how all emotions are good, even negative emotions. And one of our key problems is we think that if we're feeling a negative emotion that we're not supposed to be feeling mad, sad, or angry. And so the tendency, you know, we begin to um, habituate things like avoidance or numbing, whether that's for food or alcohol or even punishing exercise could be a way of numbing ourselves. So it's really trying to get in there to say, you know, your body is wise and it, there's a caregiver there that wants to compassionately help you through life focus on your well-being. But we've got to tune in and connect to that caregiver. And in many, many ways, dieting actually severs that connection. It just creates all this friction throughout our life. You know, nothing's ever good enough and perfectionism. That it, It's kind of like fraying a rope and it just weakens this connection. And so body kindness is really about re-strengthening that. Um, and the third pillar is called care. And it's about staying fully committed to taking good care of yourself. You know, we're humans. We are going to evolve through life. We are going to make mistakes. We're going to get a disease or condition. And how do we take in that information and process our feelings and emotions and still, no matter what, maintain our commitment to ourselves? You know, that this is about our well being and joy and having a better life. It's not going to be a pain free life. It's not going to be a disease free life. What we can do is we can grow our resilience and shift our mindset by always remaining fully committed to taking good care of ourselves no matter what, even through difficulties. So Rebecca, you know, when we graduate from our internships as dietitians, we've learned a whole lot of stuff about a lot, a little bit of stuff about a lot of different topics. And, uh, (laughs) you know, we kind of all choose our path. And so can you talk to me about how you went from your internship learning and kind of being fresh to changing to more of a health versus weight approach? Because I wouldn't say that's necessarily, well, I've been a dietitian 21 years. That's not necessarily how I was taught as a dietitian. And that's not necessarily what I've seen as the prevailing advice from dietitians. So how did you move from that type of training mentality, whatever you learn in your internship, to the healthy mind, body, weight approach? Sure. So, and thank you so much for asking. This is a very, very important question. And I will just share right away that it also was not how I was trained. You know, um, dietitians are trained in a weight normative paradigm and it's out of the medical model, which is also weight normative, which focuses on weight loss as a beneficial outcome, something to be monitored and pursued in, in whatever type cases, right? Usually the BMI is used, um, but, and there may be other factors that are looked at. But at the end of the day, a weight normative would say, give prescriptive weight loss because weight loss is going to improve health and well-being. So how did I get to a weight-inclusive place? And a weight-inclusive place is the idea of weight isn't a behavior. You can't control your weight. There are many factors that influence weight, even outside of genetics. Things like socioeconomic status really can have an impact on weight financial resources, time to practice self-care behaviors, money for the food or the exercise equipment or the fitness classes, whatever they are. There are systemic issues at play. Um, So an intersectional issue of how does a higher weight black female receive and have access to certain amounts of medical care compared to a lower weight white female? So it's a big topic. I identify and and, and um, support um, the health at every size paradigm, which is grounded around 
looking at health from a weight inclusive lens and a social justice lens. And um, there are principles that are really about respecting individuals' needs and interests and care. And I find, in my opinion, that it does intersect well with medical nutrition therapy. And hopefully we will be able to um, discuss that. Um, But what I want to say for any listener who maybe is new to hearing the words health at every size or who is just like, what do you mean, you know, weight normative versus weight inclusive? I don't understand because it absolutely is not the way that I was trained. It is not like some, you know, switch was flipped and overnight all of a sudden I knew everything and I was confident in everything. But what really happened was I made enough mistakes in my life that impacted my openness and mindset to want to look at it a different way. And I paused and gave myself time to listen and read and learn and grow. And that really was what was key for me personally. Briefly, mistake-wise, I started dieting when I was nine. I hated my body. I beat myself up for it in my mind. And what was interesting is I actually come from the socioeconomic disadvantage background and geographic disadvantage. Um, So I was a beneficiary of WIC. We had food security concerns, and it could have always been worse. But at the end of the day, that did not make me immune to comparing my body to friends. So I'd get into exercise and like it didn't matter for me if I restricted food or over-exercise because my body didn't respond like you would expect a body to respond, like losing a lot of of weight. Um, So people would often congratulate me like, oh, you're so committed and you look so good. And inside my head, I was actually really suffering with this strong inner critic. Um, So that went on really from nine all the way through college. And what was interesting was I really thought I was pursuing health, became an aerobics instructor. It helped put me through college. And I swear, like in my mind, I really did care about health. But when I'm in the front of a group fitness class and I'm like, it's bikini season, everybody tighten those buns. Like it would take me a while to learn that I was participating in a diet culture that said you should always focus on your appearance. Therein lies the problem is that health and weight got conflated and diet culture, which is the whole system that's a $60 billion plus weight loss industry, which these days it even says, oh, this isn't a diet. This is a lifestyle. If it promises weight loss, it is still a diet. So you want to be really mindful of those diets in disguise. But basically, you know, there was a lot of reading, reading the beauty myth, reading reading the book by Linda Bacon called Health at Every Size. There is a newer, very thin, and I highly recommend this book be read. It's called Body Respect, also by Linda Bacon and Lucia Offamore. And it, it, it talks about the science and also some of these systemic issues. And it just tries to separate weight and shape and appearance and health so that we don't exclude people at higher weights for pursuing a positive well-being and mind and body connection. We don't make assumptions about them based on their weight, shape, and appearance. And we also don't assume that people at lower weights, they must be free from health and disease. Um, And so it's really about inclusivity and respect. And honestly, the data, research can be, is full of bias in and of itself. I mean, there is bias everywhere, but you can actually find the data. I think the best study I would point to is Tracy Mann's um, research about Medicare's um, search for um, successful weight loss. And she had certain criteria for how long the studies needed to be and basically found that 85% of dieters will regain their weight, if not more. And so there are people who will lose weight and they're called statistical unicorns. So it's not about whether or not a person can lose weight. It's about what is best for the person's health and well-being overall, given their socioeconomic economic status and financial circumstances. But it was it was a very vi- big evolution for me, not just in my own experiences and realizing this isn't going to work for me. So I had my health scare that really woke me up was I was actually, I was going for my, I think it was my second marathon, second or third. So marathon, right? Young dietitian, second marathon. And I collapsed between mile 25 and 26 and runners saved my life. They carried me to an ice bath. My temperature was 107. I was told by a doctor, the ER doctor, that I almost died, um, that if it weren't for the runners, I surely would have. And I was racing, having being on South Beach, which makes no sense because you actually cut carbs. And I was doing it because I wanted to try to get a time to prove myself that I was a worthy dietitian and sports dietitian. And it was because I needed to look a certain way. And I was like, 
you know, why, you know, why am I craving strawberries and not eating them, but I'm eating the whole giant thing of ricotta cheese. I was like, I knew it wasn't right, but it was mistakes that I was making because it all went back to weight and worthiness and appearance that, that, that was reinforced, even by my training was reinforced about weight management for running and everything like that. So in addition to that experience, I also had several big failures with clients, things like I'd monitor them with these armbands before there were Fitbits and I'd count their sleep and count their calories with them. And I'd have a someone who was at a higher weight who would do like run, walk, even marathon distance. And then she'd cry because she caved and had pizza on a Friday night and felt that was the reason why she only lost a half a pound that week. And I'm sitting here going like, this doesn't seem right. Like, like, and, and I couldn't name that it was weight stigma, but that's exactly what it was. I mean, it's like I was letting her under fuel, right? Because clearly she had weight to lose. I could look at her and I could say, clearly you have weight to lose. And I was supporting all this stuff. And it was like, she's not having a good life if she's crying because she's eating pizza on, you know, with her husband. Um, and so it was things like that. And then also I had a family health scare too, which I do talk about a little bit in body kindness, but it has to do with my mom and she was a big chronic dieter. We did a lot of stuff together and she also had a lot of stress and uh, and hidden eating disorder and depression. Um, and, um, you know, what, what I realized as we went through her health scares and, um, that it probably was the smoking and it probably was the genetics, but it also probably was the dieting. And I just decided that I was like, I can't, I cannot keep doing this and I have to find a better way. And then that, ultimately led to studying supervision under Evelyn Triboli for intuitive eating. I went to Green Mountain at Fox Run and learned so much about eating and self-care for me. Um, like, like I went as a participant and it helped me in my practice too. And then years later, Body Kind of the book would come to be. That's just a lot to absorb what you did. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing. This is not, this might be my story, but I'm telling you, everyone has a story. Anyone who goes into nutrition has a food story, has a body story. Like you cannot separate the mind and body from human beings. Ellie Krieger, right? A James Beard award-winning chef and former Food Network TV host and very accomplished dietitian. When she was on my podcast a year and a half or so ago, she talked to me about in her modeling career, how she faced body bashing and weight stigma type messages, you know, and that impacted her and it impacted her as a mom. She didn't want to pass things on, on to her kids. So it's a culturally pervasive message, but when we're trained dietitians under the medical model, it is really hard to think about, well, how do I help people without centering weight loss as, and the thing of it is, it is an issue of control, which we can talk about, but it's about being open to a bigger picture of how do I help this person have a better day today and how do I help them improve their self-care habits from a place of love and well-being enhancement, not a place of shame and deprivation and self-loathing. And that goes across whether it's a body image and weight concern or it's a weight concern that's connected to a disease diagnosis. Um, it really is applicable across the board. It really hits home for me a little bit because my husband and I are both overweight, but yet our children are at healthy weights. So I always attribute that to the fact that I made an effort as a dietitian knowing that I'm not supposed to make them clean their plate eat the food I offer you, you know, we're going to have healthy snacks in the house and they're not obsessed with food or their weight, but yet they're at, you know, that quote unquote healthy weight, which at least for me is um, a positive thing. Cause I know that if you start young, like you said, start young dieting, it kind of becomes that thing you can't get away from because you do always gain back that weight. Or not, I know you said the unicorns, but most of the time you can get the weight. So, so I'm trying to figure out a little bit of just thinking like you mentioned body kindness and how it's love and connect and care, but it is that how is someone healthy? I'm going to, I'm going to say this from the normal medical model. How is somebody healthy if they're obese or overweight? 
I think the first thing that I would say, like speaking from the health at every size paradigm, it is health at every size, not healthy at every size. So really what it's about is about helping a person pursue health and well-being in personally meaningful ways. And there is there is absolute acknowledgement that people can be healthy and unhealthy at a wide variety of weights, right? And where where the studies show and the statistics show is that the, the extreme high ends of weight and the extreme low ends of weight tend to be the highest risk factors for early death and chronic diseases, right? But there is a big range of weights that go outside the BMI, which we know, I mean, I call the BS measurement in the book, but you know, I think you and I at least know, right, that BMI made for white men for insurance company is not science, but yet still used. There is a wide variety of ranges where people can be healthy. And also health is dynamic. Like some of the best articles I've read on it in the past couple of years talk about how wellness culture is really upheld by human beings' death anxiety right? So like we think we can live forever and we want to live forever. And we don't even deal with death right in, 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 in our culture. And so it becomes, this is the, this is the magic tonic and the potion. And this is the thing that you need to do. And if you mess up, you might get pre-diabetes or you might get diabetes and then personal responsibility, right? Shame, blame, judgment, stigma, which actually gets in the way of somebody being open and feeling hope and confidence about behavioral changes that they could make that can improve their health. So, you know, health is not a moral obligation. And if it were, that is pushing healthism. And that's the whole idea that the most important thing we could all be doing with our time is pursuing health. Now, I am a health expert and I love, like, I have a, why do I have water next to me and not a giant 64 ounce soda? Because I love water and I am not the kind of person who drinks soda. I like sugar and I like sweets, but I like them in certain ways. You get it? Right. So, and I can feel good about things I do for self care and well being and my view of health improvement, right? But my 45 year old body is more crickety than my 35 year old body, right? And running is different and things are different. And so just this whole idea that we have to put all our efforts into holding on to every ounce of health, what that does is it creates so much stigma and shame for people when they do get a diagnosis and, you know, warnings from the doctors and especially some like just talk diabetes. It's largely a genetic component. To also further invite conversation into this question, Suppose someone is at the higher ends of the obesity ranges that is correlated with an increased risk for a chronic condition or earlier death. What is it that you would do for that person at the higher weight? You know, so, so weight inclusivity is not, does not say any amount of weight loss is bad. It says that what would you do to pursue weight loss and is that good for the well being? So you have a higher weight person who now has a new diabetes diagnosis that has a history of um, an eating disorder. Ask, and you can get an eating disorder at any size, you can have anorexia at any size. It's, rest- it's restrictive and you don't necessarily waste away to nothing. Some bodies don't respond the way you think they do. But is telling somebody who has a new diabetes diagnosis, you must lose weight or you're going to have a heart attack any day now, is that really helpful? What if they have an eating disorder history? What if the information evokes fear and they say, fine, I'm not going to monitor my blood sugars. I'm not going to make any food changes. You know, somebody who makes it to an older age at a higher weight, they've been told that their body is wrong for a really long time. It's not that they haven't tried. It's not that they don't care. It's how their body responds. And we see data that came out of that um, through the Biggest Loser study, which again, small sample size because it was from people who were on just season six from the show. But what that was really interesting about that study is it showed that why do most of the people regain their weight? That with their weight loss, there were two big problems. They had leptin resistance, which did not restore as weight regained. So you know, leptin being the hormone that says, I'm full, I don't need to keep eating. They had that problem and they had the problem of metabolic adaptation and that they they did not get the expected increases in metabolism with weight gain. And what they concluded was that it, you're, you, you were better off never going on the show and having done what they did 
you know, with, you know, here's your calorie counts, here's your exercise plans. Like they were better off never going on because of the way the bodies responded. And the, the body has Sandra Amitt's my favorite person for talking about, um, she's a a neurobiologist and talks about the body's defended weight range. She has a great TED talk about why you won't usually lose weight on a diet. And she talks about the body's way for survival and defending a weight range. And if anything, what it looks like is happening is the more times you diet, the higher your body mass index is likely to climb. And like you were just saying with you and your kids, you knew, it sounds like you were doing Ellen Satter's division of responsibility, right? Trust around food trust your appetite. I'm going to decide what comes in the house. I'm going to offer balance plates. I'm not going to get into food fights with you. You know, I want you to take care of your body. That's exactly what you should be doing. And wherever their weight ends up, it ends up because it started from a place of self-care. If that means that through maybe I, I, I don't know, you could tell me, but like, is it, is it guidance that you gave that you wish you would have had or whatever it was, right? That, that you're helping your kids grow into a weight that their body can easily maintain. And then besides weight, their sleep, their exercise, their attitudes about food, their attitudes about their bodies, all these other really important things, you're giving them you know, a proper foundation that all kids deserve to have access to, even kids who trend higher on that BMI curve because there have always been higher weight kids and there always will be. And look, I believe we have issues with the food system and food access 100%. I'm not denying any of that. But you have to take a look at like how long it takes to improve systemic issues and how do you acknowledge those without adding to body shame and weight stigma. So when you have your higher weight person, how do you help them mind and body frame all this traumatic assault that dieting has put on them in their life? And how do you help them frame, I want to take this from a place of well-being and self-care and how do I make choices that I think will work for me, right? Versus external controls. You have to do this or else, you know, it's going to push a rebellion in people or shame and avoidance. Yeah. I would say mine came from being that lower income Um, food restricted as a child and then kind of the rebound of, well, I never could have this. Now I get to eat and now I have money. I can eat things. And knowing the Ellen Satter mentality, but it also was just very evident to me at the table when we would eat with my family or my mother-in-law, my my mom and my dad, that clean the plate mentality and making a happy plate. (laughs) And a happy plate is a clean plate. And I just immediately said, okay, no, that's not what makes a happy plate. What makes a happy plate is you're finished eating, you're full, you're not going to go get a snack in five minutes. But I, I also am reminded when I asked that question about healthy weight is I was in the military for five years. I was in the army as a dietitian. And one of your jobs is to counsel people who are quote unquote overweight and overweight based on a tape test It was always frustrating to me as a dietitian that in the military, your value was based on your ability to pass a PT test and to be a certain weight. And I know that there were very intelligent people who did their job extremely well and maybe didn't weigh the quote unquote special weight. So they were ostracized and basically ended up focusing intently on that until they could get their weight back down through whatever means, honestly. That was always something that was very frustrating to me. And I understood the concept of why we need people to be healthy and strong and capable of completing their jobs. And, you know, as a large system, they needed a way to determine what that meant. So, Right. And I would hope that... And again, it's like, I think if our training were better as dietitians, if our culture were better, right? Like that we had more support for things like acceptance and commitment therapies or cognitive and behavioral therapies that dietitians could be aware of and know and help apply. So it's like, okay, is there alcohol consumption, you know, going on that is unnecessary, right? Does this, you know, does this person have PTSD that is actually at the root of the problem, right? Does this person also have struggles around food that are part of it? Or is this person genetically just higher and larger? And can can we have some other ways of valuing them outside of their weight? And it it might mean there might be certain roles that they just cannot do, you know, that is part of the military. But I do think you're right. I mean, it does make you feel stuck in 
it sounds like you had a fair bit of empathy for the people as you were counseling them because it was like it wasn't that they didn't know or didn't try, but it was just like their bodies would hit a resistance wall. You know, like you said, as a young dietitian, you exercise and you you have very much that mental picture of what you think your clients expect to come see. In my mind, I would always say if they come see a fat dietitian, how am I going to help them lose weight? You know, they're thinking you can't even do it yourself, lady. <laughs> so, which is one of those things that goes in your head. Right. But that is why we actually need more fat dietitians. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm telling you, so if, if listeners don't know yet about diversify dietetics, you need to look that up because that is a nonprofit that is aimed to bring in diversity to our field in race, in gender, in size, in abilities. It's all very, very, very important because we should have a profession that is more representative of the people we serve. And we are all from different backgrounds and different genders and, and, and sexual identities. I mean, all of it. And, you know, dietetics skews highly, you know, thin, white, high socioeconomic status, female, right? But imagine how many more people we could help if we had more higher weight dietitians, right? Who, who through personal experience would have a lot of empathy and a lot of understanding about weight bias and stigma, but also because if somebody is in a larger body, they, you know, would be a great dietitian to learn the material, to smart, to, they'd be smart. They'd counsel what, like, why are we excluding them? And I think I've heard a few stories um, from people who've reached out to me when I talk about this. What it seems like is that even at the education level, they face bias you know, they hear microaggressions basically about why they shouldn't be in the program and it just hurts and they end up dropping out. So it's one of the reasons why I'm supporting Diversify Dietetics as well and like helping to coach and mentor more people through the program because our whole profession will do better and we will do more to reduce weight stigma when we have more diversity and more inclusivity in our field. And I'm just, I feel sorry that you know, you can have all this skill and caring and love in the world, but yet live in a world where you're being judged based on the way you look. Your worth is being judged. That is not right. That is the problem. When you think about this program, uh, not program is probably not the right word, but philosophy Philosophy is the right word. That's a great (laughs) word. But I wonder why you knew that. Okay. (laughs) So when you're thinking about it in that way, so it's self-care, it's making better choices, it's being more mindful. And then I get struck, and we talked about this a few minutes ago, then I get slapped in the face, okay, you got diabetes, and you got to go see a dietitian. And we have MNT guidelines that say what, as a dietitian, um, we should look at for insurance reimbursement. If I'm a dietitian who believes in this, who wants to, who wants to encourage people and do the health at every size. How does it work for somebody who then gets a chronic illness like diabetes or kidney disease or something else? So the first thing I would say is that this is another place where we need to take the sword that's pointing at individuals and turn the sword and point it at the system. Because ultimately it's a systemic problem that's based in bias. The fact that in order to get reimbursed by insurance, which is important for the dietitian in the role, it's important for the person to have access to good medical care, right? that there is a weight requirement and we should be questioning that. We should be researching that. We should be challenging that, right? Now on a day-to-day basis, like what can you do today as a listener? <laughs> what you do is it's it starts with embracing and accepting that weight isn't something that you control, that it doesn't mean that there's no work to do, Right. You can allow, and not only can, this is a very important thing for dietitians to do. We need to allow for weight concerns to exist in the room. So I'm in private practice. I'm out of network for insurance. I mean, privilege, 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 right? Somebody walk can walk in my door, make an appointment, walk in my door. They see, you know, hey, do you have weight concerns? I do non-diet focus, this and that, right? I try and all the marketing. They'll still not come in, sit down and say, ah, got to do something about this weight here. You know, I'm like literally. So you do not do a bait and switch. Oh, you want to lose weight? Come see me. Hey, health at every size. That is wrong. And 
unethical. So you market yourself in ethical ways, but you are still going to get people with weight concerns. And why wouldn't you? Their doctor told them to lose weight. Culture told them that they should lose weight. A blog they've read, like the, all the messages point to that. So don't expect your clients are going to no longer have weight concerns or going to even understand or get health at every size. It's not necessarily your job in that counseling role to be world's strongest advocate for why your client must reject weight stigma, right? <laughs> like they're there because they need you to help them. But you know and trust what you know does work, right? So respecting their past experiences with dieting, ask them, so tell me what kind of diets you've been on and tell me what your experience was like. You know, like what worked for you when you had a structure before? Um, You know, like how are you feeling with this new diagnosis? So you're asking open-ended questions and doing motivational interviewing to get a sense for the emotional and physical, mental health right then and there. So tell me what you're doing right now. And you're looking for things, behavioral things that they can do, that they have an agency over. And you're looking to grow their hope and confidence to take meaningful action toward those changes. So in a counseling session, and it's in the book, but I actually design these body kindness blueprints for people. It, they're, they're very simple drawings, like infographics, right? And like their name is in the center. So, right, put Katie in the middle. And Katie's talking to you about movement. It's like, well, you know, I know I heard that movement is important for diabetes. You know, I'm not sure why. I don't really do a lot. Oh, I have some information about that. Can I share it with you? Sure. Well, actually, movement is good because it helps to use up blood sugar. And when you have these high blood sugars, movement is something you could do to move them up. Oh, I, I understand. Understand, but you know, I like I don't have an hour to do a workout every day. Do you have any amount of time? Sure, maybe about 10 minutes. Okay, what do you think of the idea of breaking down your exercise into 10 minutes? Well, I don't know what I would do. Well, let's talk about options. What are you interested in? What have you tried before? Do you see how you get that conversation going where you're not saying the person walks in, here's your reduced calorie cut meal plan, right? You're trying to help them look at the big picture and different things that matter to diabetes around movement. Sleep, we know, impacts blood sugar levels. They probably don't know that, right? Do they sleep well or not? Are they up late because of stress? How do you help them manage stress through mindfulness? How do you help them respect an internal boundary to go to bed by a certain time so their blood sugars operate better the next day? So they might get that movement in. Even talking to them about the timing of when they might do movement. They might be open to buying those $10 resistance bands and keeping them at work. So they have you know, a lunch that they both find interesting and delicious that does not have to be low carb. We know that as dietitians, but consistent carb, right? And maybe they make a simple swap where what the things they got in a sandwich that they did start bringing a salad with, with some beans in it for the carbohydrate. And they try that out and they really liked it, right? You can help them make a, mo- a modification, but it's connecting food to taste and pleasure and joy. And when they do want a sandwich, how do you help them make a decision that doesn't feel like, oh, I've just ruined it, right? Because I've got this giant 12-inch sub plus chips plus a cookie. And so how would you help them make that modification? Tell tell me about foods that you feel like you're going to miss that you can't have anymore. Oh, I can never do spaghetti again. Let's talk about that. You're trying to help grow hope and confidence without being this like meanie food cop. Mm, Food police. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So there's so many things you could do and you build that blueprint, you know, and so your client day one decides, um, I'm going to walk for, you know, like I'm going to walk for 10 minutes, um, you know, every single day and three days a week, I'm going to go and swim because I like that. And they start there and they think about buying that resistance band. Right. And you get them on this idea that Even dancing, you know, they ate dinner, put on some songs you like and dance and do the dishes and fold the laundry before bed. That is movement and that movement counts. And if they're monitoring their blood sugars and they see that, that is motivation. That is reward. You might be listening to this and be like, well, I don't get that because that's, that is stuff I would do, but it's not rooted in shame. It's rooted in self-care and well-being because with that person, you don't know if they're going to lose weight. You can't control that. That is not your job. With respect to insurance and reimbursement, I mean, you get the visits you get and you get them to improve their labs the best you can through positive, motivating, listening skills, kindness, you know, like behavior change. And it's just, it's without the shame and the stigma. They're going to have to deal with other barriers. Like I don't like to sweat. I don't like to be seen in a larger body because when I've tried exercise before, somebody called me 
I don't, sorry if I swear you got to beat that out, but like that, that's a real thing, right? And so why wouldn't they have a negative attitude about exercise? So what we need is more empathy about their lived experience. We need to listen to our patients and we can absolutely integrate any medical nutrition therapy with health at every size and body kindness type approach that's focused on well-being enhancement. Some clients will lose weight. Some clients will not lose any weight. Some clients will lose a lot of weight. Some clients will, their diabetes will progress and they'll be on medications. And guess what? That's okay. That's what medicines are for. We need to drop the stigma about disease. That goes back to what I said in the very beginning on that we've got to stop feeling like every bite of food we take is either going to add to our health or take away from it. And that is a line pulled right from the Whole30 diet. You know, we've got to stop believing that crap and we got to really help people. That is why we went into nutrition to help people. I see that where you're working on those small changes. I know we want instant gratification. Like somebody wants you to hand them a 1500 calorie diet or an 1800 calorie diet and they'll go to their doctor in a month and their blood sugar will be perfect. And, but then what happens next? You know, so it's great that you can do that for a few weeks, but I did notice in your book, you talk a little bit about small steps and the spiraling up process in um, body kindness. Can you talk about that a little bit about the small steps and, and spiraling up? Sure. Well, let me do spiral up first as I absolutely love it. And this is not a metaphor that I created. It actually comes from positive psychology, which is a, which is, it's, it's, it's a newer field of psychology, but it's been around at least since the eighties and it's very well researched. There is a researcher named Barbara Fredrickson. Um, she's got great books out and I love all, I love all of her stuff. She has a great book called love 2.0, which is about all the different ways we experience love in life and how this positivity resonance helps literally strengthen our uh, vagal tone which as we know is our vagus nerve runs from our head down to our gut. And the strength of our vagal tone is a sign of the strength of our health and well-being and our resilience. And it's it's fascinating stuff. Um, And it's rooted in the loving kindness meditation, which is one of my favorite meditations. She came up with a theory called broaden and build and tested this theory and got evidence behind it. And the idea was this idea of an upward spiral and that the more positive emotions we experience, okay, joy, like fleeting positive emotions. When we, um, oh, I got 10 minutes to myself with my cup of coffee before my kids came charging in the room. I'm going to savor that. 10 minutes is good enough, right? (laughs) So that, or like the sun is shining and it's such a nice day. I'm so grateful for this lovely day. That micro moment of joy. When we can stop, you know, it's not Pollyanna, you know, but it's to look at the bright side of something, to look for the optimistic view in any situation. We could stop and notice these things a little bit more. The letter carrier comes and and you happen to be home. Hi, thank you for bringing me out. I really appreciate that. You know, those micro moments of connection and joy broaden and build our positive emotions. So one positive emotion begets more positive emotions and it opens you up like this idea of an upward spiral that is broad and connected, not only to your own mind and body, but to your community and to the world. There's a positive emotion that we don't experience often called awe. But if you've been to Alaska and stepped on a glacier, that was awe, <laughs> you know? Uh, and um, so, so, you know, I went to Machu Picchu, that was awe. <laughs> and, and so this idea that on a, you know, we can't go to Machu Picchu every day, right? But on a day-to-day basis, we can choose to look at these positive connections and that it positive emotions broaden and build and beget more. And the more positive emotions, you, like so positive emotions are negatively correlated with depression and loneliness and anxiety. And we know what those things can facilitate in mind and body health, right? So what I did is I took her broaden and build theory and I looked at other research and I was like, you know, if one small self-care choice, right? Like oh, I didn't get a lot. It was a bad night of sleep last night. You know, I, I'm supposed to work out this morning. You know what? I'm, I'm not going to work out today. I'll figure it out. But instead, I'm going to have like a nice caregiving morning and a breakfast. I'm going to read a little bit. That's what I'm going to do in my 45 minutes where I was going to do my workout. If, if that one small self-care choice, when you notice something's going on, you notice what you need. Can that one self-care choice create a positive emotion? And can that 
does that positive emotion lead to more positive self-care choices? And what I found out was that, yes, it does. And so I took her concept of broaden and build and applied it to spiraling up in health and well-being so that through attunement and connection to your body, you can notice a downward spiral, even if it's toward the end of the day. It's like, oh, I've been downward spiraling all day long. You can notice and say, well, what's one little thing I can do for myself that feels good, that feels like a hug. It doesn't have to change this sort of negative icky feeling or this bad thing that's happening, but it can neutralize these negative emotions, right? Because what happens is when you feel negative emotions and you're having difficulty with regulating, then you know, you're know you upset because of a work stress. And instead of going to get that workout that would be a stress relief, you might drive through, drive through, eat in the car on the way home. So it's, it's not about, I chose fast food today right? It's about, I chose fast food to numb as opposed to, you know what? I think my caregiver would say, let's do this workout. If you still want fast food, no big deal. We'll go and get whatever you want. And a caregiver might get you to think about those choice options and do that energizing workout, which you actually felt better about, could take out some anger toward your boss, right? And you're like, okay, I feel better. Now, what do I feel like eating? And you know, look, you know, in in body kindness, if you felt like going to get that fast food, you would, but maybe you would eat it at the fast food place, or you'd bring it home and eat it at a table and really savor it, right? Not, not the numbing, not the emotional avoidance. And, and, and so that is how I apply spiraling up and down is, is just that it's not, you know, you're going to feel negative emotions, but it's that maladaptive coping that we do when we say, I can't handle this or screw this. And we stop making self-care choices because we don't want to feel our pain. So what I help people do with spiraling up is feel your pain. Your pain is real. You're allowed to feel it. You're allowed to be stressed about work or angry at a boss situation or you know upset that somebody made a dig at your appearance. But you could pause and take a deep breath and say, what do I need right now that matters? And that next small choice can be a spiral up for you. I think it's important that we do make those small choices. And like you said, kind of instead of falling off that wagon and just staying off the wagon, <laughs> you're like, okay, I made a step sideways. What am what is my next choice that's going to be good for me? So that's an awesome way to think about it. You also mentioned a little bit about um, journaling in a body kindness journey. How does that help someone work through the emotions of I'm trying really hard to be healthy and not focus on the weight loss? I really love self-compassion because it's it's the voice of your caregiver. It's that it's okay. It's okay to be here right now. Like a, a, your caregiver voice is always telling you it's okay. Like even if it's bad, it's okay. You know, and, and it's very important because it makes space for the thing to exist. So I spend a lot of time um, helping clients grieve the thin ideal, you know, but again, instead of pointing the sword inward, like I'm the problem, I suck, to look at culture as the problem, right? And a person is going to let go of their desire to change their weight, shape, and appearance on their own terms. And who knows? That's not up to us as their counselor to decide for them. We can listen. We can empathize. We can help them think through because they have an inner wisdom. Um, but I know part of what helps clients is to kind of get angry at the system. We'll practice like yelling at a pillow, you know, <laughs> punching sometimes, you know, but like anger is valid and it's real. And that can sometimes help people really process like, past pains and then get to a point to where it's like, yeah, you know, like, so this thing that like my mind and shopping is like labeling what is whole 30 approved. So I'm avoiding healthy foods, but I don't want to avoid eating healthy. So it's like, well, how, how do you help them reconcile that where they can reframe positive food choices? Even if they hear this thought, oh, it's whole 30 approved, you know, that's no longer helpful for me because I'm not following a diet, but I also know I actually like the taste of broccoli and tuna and beans, and it's an easy, convenient meal to put together or something like that, right? And so it's it's learning how to reframe your thoughts that are unhelpful, that don't help you create a better life. And letting somebody hold on to weight concerns or desire to lose weight for as long as they need to, because every day they are reminded that larger bodies are not good bodies. And so they don't need to let go of a desire to lose weight in order to make progress in body kindness. My, Anyone who comes and says, I need a health at every size dietitian, I am so excited. I pull out my pen. I'm like, let's go, girl. You know, but that doesn't happen every day. So you need to make space for all the feels and all the wants. You have a client right now who's going through, she had a a prolapse, a uterine prolapse in pregnancy and she was a runner before pregnancy, told she'd never run again. She is in therapy and she's new with me and she is avoiding and has been avoiding all forms of movement. 
she's been numbing with food and she's getting better about the numbing with food part. And she's, 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 um, grieving running. She's grieving the, the body that she used to have before her baby. And, um, really what we've only had a few sessions, but what we're coming to is that she is avoiding, like, for example, her doctor said she could try cycling, um, and the stationary bike that she has at home that she's willing to do. Um, and, the, and, and she, she knows when she's feeling, um, prolapse pain and needs to stop. So we literally worked out a plan for five minutes and then give it a rest day and then five minutes and give it a rest day. And then the week two, try for 10 minutes. She's been avoiding it because what it came down to it is she's afraid. So first of all, she, she hasn't, she never really recognized what her body went through as a trauma and it is a trauma, you know, to lose your identity as a runner is a trauma. And so any, and so her mind goes through and compares five minutes of cycling compared to running is like, oh, this sucks. This isn't worth it. This isn't good. So it's all pessimism and not, not having permission to recognize that as a trauma and a loss in her life has caused avoidance. So by talking about this and acknowledging this, we have now a plan. So she'll approach movement and how to deal with her voice when it says it's not good enough and this sucks or that sucks. And so that she can face her fears and feel her fears, but take meaningful action anyway, because she knows she wants to exercise and she wants to manage her her mood with exercise. And she has a weight concern. She's hoping she will lose weight with our work together. I have to make permission for that to be in the room so I can have space to help her get to the root issues. But what I'm not going to do is say, just dig deep lady. And here's your low calorie meal plan. (laughs) You know, let's do keto baby. You know, let's do macros girl. That's not her root issue. She's had chronic dieting. She's an expert in dieting. She is able to let go of the binging because she's able to process the emotional pain of the trauma through great work and therapy and through nutritional support by me. But there's a lot of important things that need to happen. It's not my job to control when she's willing to accept her body as it is. I need to be careful not to add to the stigma and shame by saying you're worthier when you lose weight and all these other things. But I can sit with her while she sits with the pain of feeling like, her body has betrayed her. You know, you mentioned going through a store, this is Whole30 approved, this diet mentality. But isn't it true that there are some foods that are healthy and some that are not so healthy or to use a dietitian mentality, nutrient dense versus calorie dense? Um, Is there any value to paying attention to that? Yeah. I mean, and this is where I would say, you know, this is why I love working on an individual level because it's such an individual answer. I learned from Dana Sturdivant. She is one of the dietitians with Be Nourished and she was on one of my podcast episodes and she talks about nutrition being a a, a young science. And it was really true and eye-opening when she talked about that. And we do want to be mindful of nutritionism, right? And it's like, this is gluten-free and this free and that free. Even when we are mindful of all of that and ignore all those things, To me, it's an issue of developing moral equivalency of food, right? So morally, carrot cake equals carrots. (laughs) You know, from a moral standpoint, I am not a bad person because I like carrot cake. There's lots of other things we value, right? Like I value good digestion. So I want to get my fiber to have really good poops. I love a good poop, right? I knew dietitians are going to talk about poop eventually. Um, So one of the reasons why I eat carrots more frequently than I eat carrot cake is because of how I feel, you know, when I eat carrots with hummus and as an energizing snack and how it contributes to my fiber and my poops. But that doesn't mean that I have to, you know, white knuckle it through the 30 days of Whole30 and not touch a drop of sugar. I can still take my coffee with the French vanilla I like. That is not the sugar that's going to kill me. Uh, You know, so it's things like that. I am really careful about broadly labeling foods as individually good or bad or healthy or not healthy. I mean, yeah, if I'm holding a kiwi fruit in my hand and I'm going to be like, I appreciate this has vitamin C and fiber and tastes delicious. And yes, like I'm going to be like, this is a healthy food, right? But healthy living and healthy eating is patterns, right? I can eat kiwi fruit cut in half. I can dip it in chocolate and freeze it and eat it. Um, I can eat 
Hagen does the amount that I want, you know, to feel satisfied and good. Like, so it's this idea of unconditional permission, eating moral equivalency of foods and thinking about my personal why. I have a family history of diabetes. So I go to my doctor, I, I get during my physicals, my fasting blood sugars and so far so good. And I exercise and I generally eat balanced. You know, when my husband and I had a rare opportunity to go for a meal without kids and it was 1.30 and we were out for Mexican, we're like, yeah, we're getting margaritas day drinking on a Sunday. You know, and it was, and we had some chips and you know what? It was like, I, I chose to eat things that I thought felt good. It was, I noticed it was warm out. I didn't feel like hot food. I got ceviche. I wasn't sitting there with my calorie counter and saying, well, if you get the margarita, then you can't have this or that. There's a certain feel good balance that I trust now. I trust my body and there's a feel good balance that I trust. And I also value wanting to feel good before, during, and after that meal. And I did. I came home and had a nap because I'm not used to alcohol at three, you know. But um, again, we were without kids. I, it was a Sunday. I had the ability to do these things. There were a lot of factors. But if, say, I was a person who had diabetes and really needed to watch and track my blood sugars, and or if I was a person where alcohol wasn't good for me because I was pregnant or for any other reason, I would have a different set of values to frame up those decisions, right? And so that's why it's so, 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 so personal. But really what we should be teaching as dietitians is trust for our bodies, connection to our bodies, right? And including making changes to eating habits. Like it, 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 yes, it fits, right? Because of course, if somebody needs help with meal planning, you help them with meal planning. You don't say I'm a health at every size dietitian. I don't help you change Jack. No, you, there's so much to help people change, but it's in the why. And it's the, is this about shame? And, and like, you know, like my life's not going to be good unless I get into that size, whatever dress, or is it, I don't want to spend all this money, not having a structure around food and ordering out a lot. You know, I want to save money. I want to do what I can to eat more balance. And for some people, when it's pizza night, it might mean veggie toppings and they add a couple carrots on their plate, you know, but they still get to eat as much pizza as feels satisfying. But those swaps might go down from, you know, through mindfulness and mindful eating might have taken you down from, you know, four or five pieces down to two or three. I mean, again, I don't know it's individual, but like there, there are things that you can do that would influence changes that you feel personally good about. But if you have someone who's a history of chronic dieting and eating disorder, and the first thing you say is, yeah, I'll support you doing Whole30, don't you dare eat pizza, that's probably not going to be the most helpful thing for them. And they're probably not going to learn how to make choices when they're done with you. So you really have to understand the whole person, understand how you can be the most helpful and, and, and listening and being supportive. But there is, there's no shame in wanting to improve your eating patterns, but there's a big difference between, okay, let's do keto, let's do paleo, let's do whole 30, right? Or whatever that thing is. Let's do this calorie cutting thing. There's a big difference between that and helping them, meeting them where they're at and helping them with the amount of meal planning and support they need. I will say that that means sometimes that they are for at asking for things that it's like you realize is more structure than you want them to have. But also in the short term, like week one, you also understand that that structure is helpful. So if somebody comes in, you know, like I wouldn't give them end stage intuitive eating on day one. I might talk to them about working on their attunement and eating on a schedule because they don't eat till 2 p.m. or 1 or whatever it is. So I might talk to them about, okay... I have information about why it's important to eat within two hours of waking up. Would you like to hear it? Yes. Okay. Here it is. Right? And you're helping them eat on a structure because you're helping them build attunement to hunger and fullness. They don't know how to do what you'd be asking them to do with end stage intuitive eating on day one. So we really have to know the tools, learn the tools and know how they work in a counseling setting to really do our jobs better. And again, like we said in the beginning, we didn't get it in school. <laughs> We're students all over again. <laughs> well, I have found that um, I have learned so much just um, digging in, paying attention, and seeing how things evolved. But um, I'm thinking, I want to know what you think is next for this field of um, health at every size and body kindness and how is it going to affect healthcare? What, what changes do you see it making? I think the next thing we really need to look at it is from a social justice lens. So like, for example, at this year's Fancy, there's going to be a, it's, it's set up as a debate, 
right? And it's like a debate on weight management versus health at every size, right? As if this is a boxing match. Stuff like that really concerns me, to be honest. It really concerns me that if that's what they think health at every size is, it's misguided. You know, health at every size is really about social justice. And, you know, like, like I look at the world today and I look at like what, um, like someone like Emma Gonzalez, right? Like, um, you know, and, and how she is speaking out about gun control, you know, a young, bold person who is able to be resilient against adversity and use her voice for good. And I look at Black Lives Matter. I look at me two times up. It is, it is a different ball game. And social justice is becoming more and more in the narrative about we, you know, how do we really change the system with respect to understanding intersectionality? What are the disparities that people face based on race, gender, socioeconomic status? And I think, I think medicine needs to fund research in areas around weight stigma and social justice issues because we need the data that's going to support and influence insurance companies. And I also think, frankly, we just need to remember our common humanity. I love Desmond Tutu and my favorite quote of his is, my humanity is bound in yours for we can only be human together. And, and I just think that it, it, it's, it's a human rights issue and it's an issue. Of, we've got to challenge our own privileges and our own bias. And it's hard, difficult, arduous work, especially when you're working in the system that is set up to be weight normative. You know, but I think some of the most powerful people are people who, who are employed in a medical practice and who might be able to do an in-service about these issues, right? Like in private practice, I call the shots. I get to control it all. So a lot of ways it's easy for me, right? It's easier than other people, but it's like, I want people to feel empowered as an individual, open up your mind, listen to podcasts, read books, educate yourself, try something different. But like from a, from a system wide standpoint, we have to continue to look at the ways and it could take a long time to help eradicate weight stigma. But I believe we can do it. I believe we can reduce body oppression. I believe that we can look at the way that diet culture is funded by billions of dollars a year, 60 billion plus dollars a year. And I believe that we can help people improve their health and well-being and not, not, get rid of that money. I think we can shift that that money will still be there, but it's to help support people, you know, to improve their health. I think we could really blow dietitian reimbursements out of the water focused on health and well-being, you know, not weight loss outcomes. I mean, the data do- just doesn't support it. So there's there's a lot that could be done systemically and also individually. I think our voices are the most powerful thing we can use. And it is bold and brave to open up our minds and to say, you know what? I don't agree. I read this paper. Read it. You know, um, it's it, Brene Brown, one of my favorites. Um, I love all of her books. But in her latest Braving the Wilderness, she talks about when you go and step in the wilderness and it's dark and lonely and you, you feel all alone, but keep walking and keep braving because you will find other people, your people braving the wilderness too. And to me, it was an amazing metaphor for how I felt like back in 2007 and day one showing up at Green Mountain and be like, hey, I'm a dietitian just here to learn some things and really like getting help for myself, you know, admitting that I needed help around food, even though I was a dietitian, that was hard. And then kind of lurking and learning and growing and and then speaking and, and just everything. And it was not that's what I would say. It was it was not that I knew all these things, but I had the interest to take one step and to keep going. And so for anyone listening, you've, you've got the benefit of, of listening to this, getting the show notes, take one step and then keep going. Information spreads. I got to say younger dietitians are not playing around. The younger dietitians are some of the strongest and most vocal supporters of non-diet and intuitive eating and body kindness that I have seen. And I'm loving it. Um, so much so that I'm going to be offering stuff for students because I was like, oh, 
you're open to this. Let's go. Let's do this. Um, and I also think this work diversify dietetics is essential and crucial. We have to, our field needs to represent the people we serve. We need diversity across the board. Um, and we've talked about that before, but that, that with more diversity, we'll have the diverse voices and the representation and we will reduce our oppressions as well. Well, you kind of answered my next question, which was how do our users, um, how do our listeners use this in their daily life? Um, You know, like you said, just kind of finding something and taking one step. Anything else with that? Um, Oh, yes. Two big things. Tons of self-compassion, the it's okay phrase. And I would say the best phrase you're going to know is it's okay to make mistakes. You know, the fact, I mean, and this is a, it's, it's a flaw of dietitians, right? Perfectionists we are. <laughs> it is your learning and growing and you're putting your neck out there. It is okay to make mistakes. Number two, good self-care because braving this wilderness is hard and it's challenging. And it is, um, I face my own microaggressions, uh, you know, from my peers and just maybe trying to understand and maybe trying to just reject my philosophy. I don't know, but it hurts. It makes you want to cry, you know? And so you're going to see a lot of wrongs that need to be right. And a lot of things that you could do, but you can't do it all because you need your sleep, you know, secure your oxygen mask before helping others. Right. You know, um, you need, you need your sleep, you need your job, you need your families. Um, I'm going to quote Deborah Gard, who's one of the founding members of ASDA Association for Size, Diversity, and Health that created the Health at Every Size Principles. And I do this when I speak a lot too because she's told me, she says, and, and she is um, a therapist. Um, and she is, um, she said, Rebecca, dietitians have been there from the beginning. Dietitians have been there from the beginning of Health at Every Size. And every time you talk, I want you to make sure people know that because um, there's space for dietitians here and they've been there from the get-go. Um, but when you do it, you're going to get tired. You're going to see a lot of work that needs to get done and you need to take care of yourself. You need to pause. You need to still live your life and have a good, 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 good life um, because you need to re-energize. And that is a role that you'll see in any people who are doing social justice work. And fighting weight stigma is a social justice act. So my kind of off the topic question for you that I try to ask everybody is what is your favorite food? So tell us about your favorite food. Ah, well, you've already heard me mention pizza a million times. So I'm going to go, oh gosh, I'm going to have to go ice cream, you know? And I just, whenever I think of ice cream, I think about being a little girl and I think about my grandma who I lost way too young um, when I was a freshman in high school. Um, she, she had cancer and she died shortly after my grandpa died of emphysema and he worked in like coal factories and whatnot. Um, but, um, they had, um, this trailer on the lake in Ohio called Berlin Lake. And, um, which actually still in our family. So when I get to go visit and bring my girls there, it's like, I get chills. Like this is a place it was a place where I started dieting for the first time. It's a place where I went back years later to apologize to my body for all the wrongs. It's a place now where I take my kids and, you know, I water ski all silly and they laugh at their mom, you know? So it's kind of like this place of mixed emotion for me. But as a child, one of my favorite things to do was um, we'd stop and get this homemade ice cream. We got this flavor called Blue Moon and my grandma would let me order any size I wanted. And of course, I could never finish it because I always wanted the big one. Um, But just licking on this like double cone of Blue Moon ice cream and just feeling the love and, you know, the cold on my tongue and just the connection to my grandma, that connection to the lake. It's like, that is what makes me love ice cream so much. And it's rare when I actually get to enjoy Blue Moon ice cream. I found a recipe and so I'll make it at home with my girls. If I ever see it on a menu, I would get it. But it it doesn't have to be that flavor. When I have it, I stop and think about the happiness and what it means to me. And yeah, I have ice cream a lot and it's not all that fireworks on the 4th of July, amazing blue moon flavor, but I can still cultivate the meaning in it. Um, and that's what I try to focus on. And so, you know, and I think most people who would answer, you know, or who are listening and thinking of their favorite, I guarantee you what it brings up is some type of positive joyful memory you've had. And that's what food is supposed to be. And if we can just remember that as dietitians and as, as we, as, you know, when we have to talk about decisions around food, remember cultural 
you know, differences, remember experiences that also matter, that also contribute to our health and well being. Yeah, food can have such emotional value. And you're right, when we can make it positive, slow down, enjoy it, you know, feel that love that we we do love having. So all right, Rebecca, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. I know my listeners learned a lot about body kindness and health at every size and just changing that paradigm a little bit to be more weight inclusive or health inclusive. I can't remember. Is it weight inclusive? Okay. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So with respect to weight, it's weight normative versus weight inclusive, but but also health inclusive, right? Like if anyone has any health concerns or, you know, you know, we're not going to judge them for that. We're going to help them do the best they can, um, you know, through kindness and connection to their body and still have a good life. You know, I'll, I'll hear some people say, oh, what's well, the lowest weight you can weigh and still have a good life? It's like, ah, okay, really? The apps, like, well, then what are you helping them pursue to pursue that lowest weight you can weigh and have a good life? You know, it's, it's about not you like taking weight away from a behavior thing that you control. You observe any changes that may or may not happen with weight while you stay intentionally focused on well-being and positive choices that fit individual needs and preferences and abilities. I think when you let go of that, like you said, weight outcome, and you allow yourself to make those small changes, be kind to yourself, and just in general feel better about yourself, you're going to make people around you feel better about themselves and that happiness, and it, and it can be a very positive experience, whether it comes out to be some weight loss or not. So, so Rebecca, if listeners want to connect with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, my website, bodykindnessbook.com is the best place and you can get, um, a free body kindness, get started kit, including a free chapter of the book. If you just click, get started and give your name and email and I'll check in with you, um, as you're reading through the book and kind of share a little bit more backstory about my approach and philosophy. And there's a whole other set of tools there, a video. Um, if you're someone who likes to track things, especially those like, you know, calorie counting trackers and other things where you put lots of detail in, I actually have a different way of tracking what's like how much sleep did I get? And what's my mood like? And so, and there's nutritional tracking around balance on your plate and stuff, but not that sort of level of detail. So that's helpful for folks who feel attached to tracking, but want to let go and kind of start, do a better job at connecting to their body. So I recommend that. And then just in case there's any listeners who qualify for the research study for pregnancy and postpartum, that's bodykindnessbook.com slash research. And there are free eBooks available. Um, if you haven't read Body Kindness yet and you qualify, you download the eBook, you read it, and then you complete the survey when you're done reading. Well, you answered my, I was going to ask about participating in the study on body kindness. Okay, great. <laughs> Well, guys, this has been another great episode of the Nutrition Experts podcast, the podcast that is all about learning more so you can do more with nutrition in your life. You've just listened to an episode of the Nutrition Experts podcast. Be sure to get more information about this week's episode at www.nutritionexpertspodcast.com. Tune in next time for another great conversation with a nutrition expert and expand your personal knowledge in the field of nutrition one conversation at a time.